fatal car crash. Generational genocide. Child mortality. Not the typical themes that come to mind when you're doing a Christmas show. Unless perhaps you're directing this year's EastEnders. No, I won't be afraid. No, no. I won't I be afraid. Put the name Roald Dahl on the poster. Throw in a few step, 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 ball change musical numbers. And paint it all with so much pink that you may tempt Jordan to get remarried. And you have this year's family friendly ish Christmas treat now being served at the National Theatre's Olivier. And what a treat this production of The Witches is, with camp performances, cheeky jokes, catchy songs, and cute kids. Sure, there's uh, the occasional disappointment, but hey, isn't that just as much a part of the Christmas tradition? disembodied voice bellows and with that we're straight into the first musical number. A lollipop lady, a nurse, a, a teacher and such like, all seeing how they're not the nice middle class cardigan wearing ladies they seem to be. They are in fact. How? And the tone is set for this latest role of doll adaptation by Lucy Kirkwood and David Malloy. Kirkwood is known for writing straight plays for Mosquitoes and The Welkin, whereas Malloy has written musicals including Preludes and Moby Dick. Putting them together, this is something quite, quite different, but it works. Flipping between darkness and light with, with humour both silly and sharp, it's a family show you can enjoy without having to go with your family. This isn't the first time in which it's been adapted for stage, since it was published 40 years ago, there has been a, a straight play by David Wood on at the Duke of York in 1992. So, my darling boy, you won't last long in this world if you don't know how to spot a witch when you see one. In 2008, an opera, but you probably know the story from one of the two major film adaptations. 1990's Angelica Houston vehicle. You are in for a treat or the 2020 release starring Anne Hathaway. I have a plan. Von Roth to transform a child into a mouse. Both of these films were creative with the original story, as is their want. But the first so annoyed Dahl that he called it utterly appalling. Now, this means, if that's where you know the story from, that you may be shocked by some of the darker Dahlisms on stage. The show comes with an 8 plus warning, but if your child is of a particularly sensitive disposition, you may want to add a couple of years onto that. Not that it's in any way scary, really, but it is quite real. Scary. In case it's been a while, and it probably has, it's a brief plot reminder. Our hero is ten and a half year old Luke, here played by the adorable, ever smiling Bertie Kaplan on Press Night That I Saw. Not long after we meet Luke, he is in a car with his parents. There was a terrible accident. Both parents die. Kaplan still manages to keep smiling. Luke is saved from a life in care by the sudden arrival of his Norwegian gran, who he only knows because his parents called her bonkers, but he's never met. Sally Ann Triplett is a very young-looking 85-year-old witch hunter 
She has the voice of a detective from Scandi Noir. The killer could be anyone in Helgesund. That's over seven people. Wait, I'm getting a call. Allow me to slip into fluent English. And the moves of Mrs. Overall from Acorn Antiques. <laughs> Tea. Brown has no sooner warned Luke to be wary of women wearing wigs, gloves and bitchy shoes when he, of course, runs into one of these witches in disguise. The ensuing fight gives Brown a heart attack and they're packed off to convalesce in a hotel in Bournemouth, the hotel that's also playing host to the RSPCC. Of course, the RSPCC doesn't exist and these ladies may not be what you think. Luke and Gran set about trying to thwart the witch's plans to turn the world's children into mice, but not before Luke and his new friend become Murai themselves. The transformation between mouse and boy is handled very sweetly, with the boys sometimes adorning ears, legs and a tail, segueing neatly into little robotic toy mice that scurry around the stage. It may be old school, but it's effective in its simplicity. It's all a jolly romp, but with more pizzazz than panto, with songs playing a pivotal role in plot development. Feelings of loss are dealt with in the time it takes to sing a ballad. Characters are fleshed out within the space of their one song. Plot points begin and end within three minutes. There's little time to catch a breath. But that works here. This isn't a show with deep messages. If you want to spend time contemplating Rawls' anti-Semitism and misogyny, read the book. This show is not to be thought about, it's to be looked at. And look at all that pink. From the decor at the Hotel Magnificent, to the hotelier's outfits, to a whole chorus of dancing sweets and cakes, that's reminiscent of the dancing dresses and expressing yourself from Billy Elliot the musical. You don't need to think when you're faced with this much pink. The main roles are arguably written as caricature, but they are all given fully committed performances. Catherine Kingsley's Grand High Witch has the confident, classy glamour of Norma Desmond. Her voice is a powerhouse. During a, a clever bit of staged audience interaction, you get the impression that she really, really does not like children. She calls them a This is likely to cause a bit of an outcry in the small but very vocal exodati. Then we have Daniel Rigby's tightly coiled hotel manager, Mr. Stringer. Rigby's performance is an easy scene stealer. He revels in the whole silliness during his two laugh out loud numbers filled with zippy one liners. Smaller roles also benefit from some big name casting. Ecal Corte and Maggie Service deliver comic lines with panache as Bruno's proudly overbearing parents. Chrissy Beamer as the witch's assistant, Melanie. The crackling with electricity. The other witches are made up of many performers we would normally see in leading roles. Just to name a few, there's Bobby Little, standing at the sky's edge. Zoe Burkett, Moulin Rouge. And Julie Armstrong, recently seen in Follies of the National. It's just overflowing with talent that makes the stage shine. The show also has 30 children in three rotating casts. Coincidentally, one in three of these children also have three names. On first night, along with Kaplan's Luke, I saw Sian Eagle Service as Bruno and Jersey Blue Georgia as Helga. See what I mean about the three names. I personally get a bit itchy watching stage school shallow performances that rely more on tits and teeth than emotion. Oh my god, oh my god, you guys! Looks like hell's gonna win the prize! If there ever was a perfect couple, this one qualifies! Oh my god, you guys! 
any tendencies towards this style of performance is, is forgiven as each of them deliver their show-stopping solo with clarity, confidence and charisma that deserve their almost ovations. The second act doesn't quite maintain the energy of the first. It's a bit padded out, more like a, an extended scene than the entire act. The first act nipped by, and when the curtain falls, it feels like the almost three hours it's been. But there's still plenty to enjoy. Um, we see designer Lizzie Cashin finally letting loose on the revolve, taking us from the garish glamour front of house in the restaurant to the delicious detritus and behind the scenes of the kitchen. And there is magic to behold. Simple but sweet trickery has Luke appear at one point of the stage, then turn into a mouse, scurry around and reappear at the opposite end of the stage within seconds. Co-illusion designers Will Houston and Chris Fisher haven't anything to worry Curse of Child, but it's a nice job done well. However, some of the songs now pause rather than progress the plot. The scene in the kitchen is accompanied by a seemingly endless number that includes the lyrics soup oop de doop 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 ad infinitum. It's fun at first, it soon starts sounding like the crazy frog. Not comparison, many writers of musicals would like to have about one of their songs. This version also sticks with the book's original ending. I'm not going to give that away here, but I will say it's one of the things that did cause controversy with the book's release, with some people saying that Dahl was glamorising suicide. Dahl's books may still be popular, but his views were never populist. There are reasons why the witches may not be everyone's cup of tea, but it is an arguably the sort of Christmas production we expect from the National Theatre. Entertaining, it's energetic, it's exciting, it's a feast for the eyes and the ears. Finally, it allows us to put to rest the hex of hex as being the last Christmas production at the South Bank. Of course, there have been other dabbings with Dahl in musical theatre, in which comparisons are bound to be drawn. I've not seen Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, so can't comment. I will say, though, that even though we miss the magic of Minchin and Matilda, This show could easily be seen doing a spell in the West End itself. So don't give up, make it count, one in love. Think of it less as a replacement daughter, more of a, a favourite new nephew. As such, this should be a welcome addition to any family this Christmas. And it feels like the National Theatre is saying welcome back to Christmas this year too.